Hi guys, welcome back to yet another fun DIY sailboat refit video here aboard good old Athena. And also good old Oblix. Hopefully a little bit later this week I can put Oblix up on the hard, scrape her bottom, apply new bottom paint, spiffy up the top sides and also install the new cockpit locker lids or hatches from last week's video. Here down below Oblix is fresh smelling and squeaky clean. With the exception of popping in a new pair of batteries and the exterior stuff, I think she's about ready for sale. Here aboard Athena, it is finally time to yet again have functioning light switches out in the forward cabin. I'll do that using a little bit of digital switching magic from Seasone. This somewhat chaotic looking pile of boxes is my digital switching test setup. Boiled all the way down to its simplest form, you could say that digital switching is basically just being able to control some relays, in this case over enemy A2000. Of course the boxes I've got here will let me do a lot more than just that. If I hit this little button again you'll see this light turn off and you'll also see two switches up here on the chart cutter turn off just like that. And then if I use this little wireless key fob here and hit the number one, you'll see all of that turn on again. And the state is reflected by the light that's on here in this switch and also by the two little green bars up here on the chart plotter switches. What happens when you hit this switch is determined not by wiring but by software. With this software you tell the boxes exactly to do when you hit this little switch. I'll show you a little bit more of the configuration tool once I've got the boxes installed and all of the lights hooked up. But we can do a lot of cool stuff in there like for instance dimming or what's called modes. But uh, we'll get back to that. Let me take the test setup apart so I can show you each of the boxes. Here are the three boxes. This one is a Contact 6 Plus. This has six outputs and this is what was powering this light you saw turn on and off before. This will turn lights on and off and also dim them. The Contact 6 Plus is the little brother of the OI or output interface I've got installed out in the clothing locker which is going to control all of the electronics and the nav lights in the mast. The output interface has more features than the Contact 6 Plus. For instance the output interface will give you an alarm if a nav light fails. The Contact 6 Plus can't do that. But the Contact 6 Plus is about half the price and for interior lighting I don't need alarms if they fail. Let's move on to the next box which is the SCI or switch control interface. I think you guys can figure out what this does. It basically just allows you to hook up physical buttons. They offer two different kinds. There's this round single throw one and there's this square double throw version. The SCI will allow you to hook up eight switches. If you use the single throw switches then you get eight inputs. If you use the double throw switches well then you basically get 16 inputs. But the single throw switches are a little bit nicer to look at and they're also a heck of a lot easier to install. And that brings us to the last box which is the SI, the signal interface. Right now I've got it hooked up to this wireless key fob doodad here but that is only one example of what this box can do. The SI is kind of cool because you can hook a bunch of different stuff up to it. The black box here with all of the wires dangling from it is just a bunch of relays that's controlled by that wireless key fob. So you could hook a float switch in the bilge up to this guy or you could hook a tank sender, one of those traditional resistive ones up to this guy. There's a whole heap of possibilities. Let me go ahead and get these boxes mounted and then we can take a quick peek at how they're wired. After a little bit of fiddling about I now have two switches here in the forward cabin. One up here and one here at the head end of the V-berth. The way the lights are configured now when I turn them on and off they'll dim up and down. Now that's gonna look really bad on camera. That's just the way it is. To the naked eye it's a nice smooth transition but yeah the switches work and it'll also turn back on again. There is however one little annoying thing and uh, that's the fact that the LEDs are humming. Just to be perfectly clear the flickering you're gonna see is only on camera. I, I can't see that flickering but I don't know if the camera could pick that up but yeah the LEDs are definitely humming. It's now a couple of days later and I would absolutely have sworn that I tested these LEDs before purchasing 20 of them. 
But yeah, I must have messed up somehow because these hum. I found this alternative. It's not as nice as the one that's humming. This one is 12 volts only. This one is 12 volts or 24 volts. But yeah, uh, the humming is definitely a no-go. I will continue the hunt for the perfect LED because the one I've found now is just a the hair too yellow for my liking. But I'm sure there is something out there that will be the right color of light and not hum. But I promise to show you a little bit of the configuration interface. Over here is a list of configured circuits. Down here is one called light ceiling forward cabin. That consists of two loads, which is the lights that's over the washer dryer, sort of the little sitting area in there. And then the other circuit is over the V-berth. So both of those two are controlled by these controls up here. There are two buttons on the SCI. That's the button near the door and the one at the V-berth. And then also button number one on the key fob. I realized that the key fob might seem a little bit redunculous, but I think it's gonna be a really cool feature. Say for instance, we are approaching the boat in a dark anchorage and we wanna turn on all of the exterior and interior lights before getting to the boat so we're not fumbling around in the dark. Well, this will let us do that. I think it works up to around 50 or 80 meters away, but uh, most of the interior lights are gonna be installed on the solar arch. So we'll get back to the key fob once I've got the arch installed. For now, I'm just really glad to have functioning light switches out in the forward cabin so I don't have to unscrew connections from the bus bar to turn off the lights anymore. But uh, yeah, my plans for the C-Zone stuff got a little bit derailed by the humming LEDs. So I think we'll get back to the C-Zone stuff in a few months when the boat is more put together and I can show you more of the wiring and the setup. I just got word that the crane is good to go. So let's get Oblix up and hard for the first time in years. Ta-da! Obelix back up on the hard with all of her new friends. There is a little bit of growth here, but it is super, super easy to remove. I think we used to just dump all of this stuff here back in the marina, but I don't believe that's allowed anymore. So I'm gonna have to scoop all of this up, put it in some plastic bags and drop it off at the recycling center. I'm sure the critters here don't share my excitement, but this is very rewarding. These three piles represents all of the stuff that was growing on both sides of the hull. That's not bad for two years. If anybody is in the market for four bags of assorted seafood, I've got a really good deal for you. I'm gonna leave the hull sitting overnight and then tomorrow afternoon I can get busy sanding everything underneath the waterline. I am by no stretch of the imagination a boat detailing expert. I'm more in it for the oh glorious sanding than the detailing, but I have picked up a couple of tricks over the years. There's quite a bit of yellow or brownish discoloration along the waterline that's very typical for boats around here. And what we normally do to get rid of that discoloration is to use a little bit of oxalic acid. While this crystalline form is quite festive, to be able to use it on the boat, I have to dissolve it in some water. And I think it's typically a 10 to 20% solution. The crystals dissolve much easier in warm water, so let's heat up a little bit of water. Come on! So slow. It is a little bit cold outside today. It's only five degrees Celsius. So the reaction might be a little bit slower, but hopefully it'll still work. And we're waiting and waiting. Thank you. So I guess a watched kettle does boil. All of the crystals are now dissolved. So let's go ahead and get this applied.
ta-da! I think we can all agree that that is a big improvement. She's an old boat still, but that oxalic acid works just like magic. There were a few barnacles on the hull, and rather than trying to sand the little footprints here away, I'm gonna use a little bit of hydrochloric acid. That sounds a little bit dangerous, but I think if you check the back of the bottles of barnacle remover you can buy at your local marine store, I am pretty sure that is mainly hydrochloric acid. I only used a tiny bit of acid. I left it on there for a few minutes and then used a scraper to remove the barnacles. The acid really seemed to loosen up the little footprints and uh, then I rinsed the entire hull thoroughly with water. There's gonna be very, very little sanding required tomorrow. I've already picked up my vacuum and my sander from the workshop, so hopefully the hull will dry overnight and we can get a nice early start on the sanding. It wasn't supposed to be this way, but it is a little bit misty slash rainy today. So I'm gonna postpone the O Glorious sanding until either later today or tomorrow. But I can still go ahead and spiffy up the top sides. For that, I'll use these products from Reinskeep. These were provided to me free of charge by the manufacturer. Reinskeep has a really good reputation around here. It is a Danish company. They do offer their products outside of Denmark also. So I figured it might be fun to go ahead and give them a try. I don't have any experience using these products yet. So I'm not going to go into a ton of detail. But I am basically going to use the same products for Athena when it comes time to clean her. Although the the process for a painted surface is a little bit different than a gel coat surface. But yeah, we'll uh, go into more detail about these products in the future. For now, let's just do a quick overview. For Oblix, I'll start out using the gel coat cleaner. This gets mixed with water and it just leaves a squeaky clean surface that's ready for the rest of the products. After that, I'll use the liquid rubbing compound with this woolly mammoth here that is gonna bring back the gloss to the surface. And I believe this is roughly a 6,000 grit. After that, it is on to the pre-sealer, which I believe is the equivalent of 8,000 grit. Then it's on to the shampoo and then finally the sealer. But I believe this is supposed to be on there just to dry a little bit and uh, while seeing as it's raining today I might hold off on applying this until tomorrow but we'll see. One of the things that made me curious about these products is the fact that you don't need to use a lot of water which is good because the water still shut off here on the pontoons for the winter. For instance the gel coat cleaner it takes half a liter of water and then just 50 milliliters of cleaner. Reinskeep recommends that you mix that in a spray bottle and you just spray that directly onto the top sides, wipe down with a microfiber cloth, and well, that's basically that step done. If you want to try these products, fear not. The instructions are available in English and a bunch of other languages, even though it is a Danish company. And uh, yeah, Reinskeep means clean boat or clean ship. It's still misty and miserably wet outside, so I'm going to leave the fancy camera here aboard Athena. Let's bust out the trusty old GoPro and start up a time lapse. <laughs> I was waiting in the undertow Set adrift with featherweight light like bows Unaware of where my heart would flow I was waiting in the undertow Can't touch the bottom Sit into a tumble Waves that shake me out. Like I said, I am no boat detailing expert, but I think this gets a big thumbs up. It was a bit of work, but the result looks pretty dang spiffy. I haven't applied the sealer yet. That's the final step in the process because it's still kind of wet outside. So I want to hold off until tomorrow to apply this. It shouldn't really make the hull any more glossy than it already is. It's just to protect it. But uh, yeah, that's perfectly fine with me. I am very, very satisfied. In an attempt to get a little bit ahead of schedule, I tried sanding the anti-fouling or the bottom paint, but it's still a little bit too wet. So it just kept gunking up the paint. 
paper. So yeah, that will also have to wait until tomorrow. It is a much nicer day today. It's still kind of windy and cold, but at least it's not raining. So uh, let's start out with the sealer. I was recommended to work in smaller sections and make sure that I don't leave anything sitting for multiple days, because if I do that, apparently it is supposed to be very hard to remove. Apply with a damp cloth, let dry, and then just remove. That was pretty straightforward. And I gotta say, Obelix's hull hasn't looked better in probably decades. It's pretty shiny, almost ridiculously so for a 50 year old boat. Now, of course, what I've done here hasn't fixed any of the little dents or scrapes in the gel coat, but in terms of shininess, it's a 10 out of 10. The hull seems to have dried nicely over the night, so uh, let's get to some oglorious sanding and cross our fingers that the paper doesn't get gummed up today. Yep, so much better than yesterday. Now it's just a matter of getting it done. Sanding done, masking tape applied. It is time for the final step, and that's to apply new anti-fouling or bottom paint. This is the stuff I'll be using. It's the same stuff I applied six years ago when I last applied bottom paint to Obelix and as you saw there were some areas without any growth at all so I think it's safe to say this stuff works. This stuff is on the cheaper end of the scale for bottom paint but it seems to work great. Bam! Polished and new anti-fouling. I think Obelix looks pretty dang spiffy. And the starboard side also looks spiffy. I think Obelix is coming along nicely. And there's actually a guy swinging by in about an hour to take a look at her. Now he can only see the exterior today because I'm not super confident with the way she's sitting in that cradle. So I don't want us tramping around inside of her. So he'll have to come back later to see the interior. But still, it's exciting. For me, it was reassuring to get a nice thorough look at Obelix's hull below the waterline. There was absolutely no sign of osmosis. The Alvin Bells are not really prone to that, but still, also there were no delaminated repairs or any other kind of wonkiness. So yeah, I feel good about selling Obelix. Because of the cradle situation, I'm gonna hold off until next week to replace the cockpit locker lids or hatches. Those are done, just waiting up at the workshop. I'm also gonna replace the two batteries and clean the deck next week. But yeah, I'd say Obelix is probably 90% ready for sale. So after next week, Obelix should be 100% ready for sale. Here aboard Athena next week, I hope to get started building the area in the aft cabin for the lithium batteries. That should also be a lot of fun. So yeah, I hope to see all of you guys back here aboard Athena next week for yet more DIY fun. As always, feel free to leave a comment down below. And don't forget, if you've enjoyed this video, remember to leave a like. See you.